ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Baker Institute and to Rice University. It is truly our honor and pleasure to have the Ambassador of the State of Israel, His Excellency Dr. Michael Oren, uh, with us today. He has an incredibly busy schedule, and he really did carve out time uh, to be with us, given all the events in the region. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, the United States-Israel relationship is one of the most important bilateral relationships that the United States has in the world. The closeness of that relationship was brought home to me when I arrived in Israel with Francoise and our family in January 1993 to assume my duties as the United States Ambassador. If you think the American press is sort of wild and out of control, take a look at the Israeli press. Uh, there were all sorts of flashbulbs going on at Ben Gurion Airport, and a major article in the paper the next day was a photo of our daughter's cat. And the caption was, New American Ambassador Promoting Aliyah to Israel. And they described that Francoise and my daughter Francesca were in New York and some Jewish friends gave my daughter a cat. Jewish family gave a cat to our family, so we were promoting Aliyah. And that was it. No photo of me, nothing about me, but about our cat. Uh, during my time in Israel, I was privileged to work with the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. He was a true statesman and became a personal friend. He spoke wisely and persuasively when he described major geopolitical trends in the Middle East. One was certainly the quest for Arab-Israeli peace, and the other was the evolving and complex situation in the Middle East as a whole. Today, Israel cannot but be very concerned observer of its troubled neighborhood. No one can predict what scenarios will play out in Egypt, given the dynamics at play and the complexity of the situation in Egypt and the region as a whole. I think we are all hoping for an orderly transfer of power and political transition that is responsive to the needs of the Egyptian people and provides them with both security and justice and maintains Egypt's key regional and international commitments and responsibilities, including the Keystone Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty signed in 1979. Our speaker is eminently qualified to address these and other important subjects. You have his biographical information in your program notes, and I'm not going to repeat them. But he is both a scholar and a practitioner of public policy. And Mr. Ambassador, that is the logo of the Baker Institute, to bring scholars and practitioners together. So we really have a deal. We have two for one in you. And we're pleased to have you here. He's a graduate of Princeton and Columbia. He's been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown universities. And he's the author of two New York Times best-selling books on the Middle East. Our speaker is, in short, one of Israel's most respected scholars and an expert on the history of the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Michael or into the podium. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ambassador Jeregi, and thank you. We, we worked together, what, almost 20 years ago during the Rabin years when I was a, a junior advisor in the Rabin government. And I just walked in, I haven't seen him, and he hasn't aged a day since then, and I found it very disconcerting. He says it's Armenian genes. I want to get me some of those. Can I please? You look great. Thank you so much. I'm, 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 I'm really delighted to be at, at Rice and the Baker Institute today because um, I had planned an entire week. Um, our, our extraordinary consul general here, Mayor Shlomo, had planned this wonderful trip throughout Texas, Austin, El Paso. I was going to take a little junket to the University of Oklahoma. Because of what happened in Egypt, some of you may have been aware, it all got canceled. But my but mayor said to me just before the other night, he says, you cannot cancel Houston. You got to come here. So I'm in Houston today. It had nothing at all with the fact to do with the, uh, the fact that I had tickets to the Super Bowl yesterday. <laughs> Completely unrelated. There's only one better thing for an Israeli ambassador to go to the, than to go to the Super Bowl, and that is to be completely nonpartisan in the Super Bowl. Ask me who I rooted for. You know, 
nobody. It was a great game. Terrific game. Delighted to be here. Terrific. It's interesting that we, 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 we mentioned Robin. Um, Robin had a role in my being here today, a very important role. Uh, as you heard, I, I, I grew up in New Jersey, um, probably spend more time uh, defending the state of New Jersey than I do defending the state of Israel. <laughs> a maligned state. It's a lovely state, I want you to know. Wonderful shoreline, pine barrens. Um, but I, I grew up in New Jersey. I, I grew up in a, a Zionist household, and I, I was a member of a Zionist youth movement. And the great sort of apogee of our Zionist youth movement year was going to Washington for a meeting with the Israeli ambassador. And I was 15 years old, and in walks the Israeli ambassador to the United States, and we, we stood up on our chairs, and we applauded till our hands were numb, and we screamed, and we sang in Hebrew, and I thought to myself, that's what I'd like to be when I grow up. And his name was Yitzhak Rabin back then, and uh, it was a great dream of mine to do that, and I uh, pursued that dream, um, and went off to Israel, worked on the kibbutz, um, I was very much influenced by the great axiom of the founder of the Zionist movement, Theodore Herzl, who said that if you will it, it is no dream. But then as I became more literary minded, um, I, I learned of a corollary to that axiom, uh, quoted not by a Zionist, not by a Jew, but by the great English, actually Irish poet, uh, William Butler Yeats, who said, uh, in dreams begin responsibilities. And if I had to defend Israel's, or defined, Israel's uh, raison d'etre, the actual definition of Zionism is Jews taking responsibility for themselves. We take responsibility for our, our lighting systems, our sewer systems, we take responsibility for our successes, we take responsibility for our setbacks. And when I finally uh, moved to Israel as a younger person, I learned about the full import of responsibilities. Uh, I became a soldier, uh, fought in several campaigns, a weighty responsibility, and then when I got out of the army, I went to work for the government, and I went to work for the person who had inspired me when I was a kid. I went to work for Yitzhak Rabin, and at the time of his assassination in 1995, I learned about the full weight of sovereign responsibility, what a terrible responsibility it could be indeed. And in the interim, I, I became an academic and spent much of the three decades studying uh, diplomacy in the Middle East, particularly American involvement uh, in the Middle East. And my, my last book was about the history of American diplomacy, cultural economic involvement in the Middle East beginning in 1776 uh, to the present. And um, one of the most fascinating studies I'd ever undertaken. And I learned a tremendous amount. And I felt that uh, coming into this job about well, over a year and a half ago, I thought I knew the American-Israel relationship rather intimately. I knew its origins. Um, I knew that the American-Israel relationship did not begin with the creation of the State of Israel, that in fact it goes much further back uh, in the American experience. It goes back literally to the day when that first buckled shoe lit on a certain rock off the shore of Massachusetts. And the owner of that shoe, a gentleman by the name of William Bradford, uh, made a declaration. He said, come, let us declare the word of the Lord in Zion. Um, now, Massachusetts is a lovely state. It's not often conflated with Zion. But in the mind of William Bladford and the 101 pilgrims who had come with him, the, the New World was very much the uh, old promised land. This was a new promised land, the old promised land. If you come from the Northeast, you've got about a thousand towns and cities with Hebrew names. You have your Jerichos and your Bethlehems and you have your Sharons and your New Canaans and Connecticut. And um, the Puritans were a Protestant dissented, dissenting group that uh, had suffered terribly at the hands of the Church of England. And um, in an attempt to find a biblical model to enable them to better cope with their suffering, they looked back into what they called the Old Testament and they found something rather extraordinary. They found a God who spoke directly to his people in their language and they loved that story and they appropriated the Jewish biblical narrative and they became the new Jews. So here were the new Jews entering the new promised land and they gave their kids Hebrew names like Benjamin and Rebecca and Sarah and David uh, and they made Hebrew a, a mandatory language at their universities. Uh, James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton, and he failed. He had to do an actual, another year at Princeton. Now they put Hebrew in the logo of Yale and Columbia and Dartmouth. Hebrew was up there. 
and, and so closely identified was the, with the Hebrew narrative were the founding father generations that at the conclusion of the American Revolution in 1783, there was a big debate about what was going to be the great seal of the United States of America. And there were some misguided American leaders that thought it should be the bald eagle. But there was another group of American leaders who thought, no, that the, the great seal of the United States of America should be Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage into the promised land. It's the pilgrims, you know, these were the new Jews. And uh, there was a heated debate in Congress over what was meaning the great seal. And for some reason, they chose that follically challenged bird <laughs> over, over uh, Moses. But you should know that the Moses seal uh, was designed by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. It's how deeply internalized this biblical narrative was in the founder of this generation. Now, for this generation, and for post-colonial Americans, the, the, the notion that they were the new Jews and that America was the new promised land meant that they had a very close association, a kinship almost, with the old Jews and a close association with the old promised land, then of course known as Palestine under the Ottoman Empire. And they concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to get those old Jews back to their old promised land so they could recreate their ancient state a notion known as restorationism, which was anything but peripheral in early American history. It was, uh, it was very mainstream. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said it was his greatest dream, dream that 100,000 Jewish soldiers would mark, march back into Judea and reclaim it as a Jewish kingdom. Uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1863 said it was his vision that someday he could assist the Jews to reclaim that ancient state and that he pledged to, to do that, to realize that dream once he had restored American unity after the Civil War. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, the grandson and son of Presbyterian ministers, uh, said that he couldn't believe that he had the right, he had the ability, the great privilege to help restore the Jews to their ancient homeland and for that reason he supported the issuance of the Balfour Declaration in 1917 through which the British Empire pledged its support uh, to recreating the Jewish state, and it's very doubtful whether the British would have done so without the direct support of Woodrow Wilson. He was actually instrumental in the issuance of the Balfour Declaration. Amazing. And this, uh, this notion of a steep spiritual connection uh, between the idea of America and the idea of a recreated Jewish state in the Jewish homely land, the land of Israel, became a, a, a major theme in American foreign policy making toward the Jewish state. Harry Truman in 1948 in, in, in an event which is completely unique, I think, in the annals of, uh, and Ed, you might want to back me up on this, the completely unique in the annals of American foreign policy making with the entire foreign policy establishment of the United States, the State Department, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, everybody tells the president that he should not recognize the Jewish state when it comes into being on May 14, 1948, because it's going to be a disaster, the Arabs are going to cut off oil to the west, Europe's going to fall to the communists, the American army is going to have to intervene in Palestine to save the Jews because they don't know how to fight. Um, and Truman overrides them all. Uh, on May 14, 1948, he makes America the first nation on earth to recognize the recreated Jewish state known as Israel. And asked why he did this, Truman also had a very simple answer. Um, Truman, who had memorized the Bible by age 14, so he claimed, uh, had been a member of a restorationist group called the American Christian Committee for Palestine, said, I did this because I'm Cyrus. I'm Cyrus. Now, I can always know people who know their Bible because they start nodding. Cyrus, of course, was the ancient Persian king who restored the Jews to their ancient homeland, rescued them from, uh, from exile. So Truman saw himself as, as Cyrus. And this notion of a spiritual connection really becomes this leitmotif in the U.S.-Israel relationship. You can look in the uh, diary of Nixon and his grandmother tells him if he turns his back on Israel, the world will come to an end. Lyndon Johnson's mother told him something very similar. I think it's, uh, it's a Texas thing. And um, uh, working with Robin in the 90s, um, Bill Clinton came to visit us and he told us a story that when he was a kid growing up, he didn't really have a father and his Baptist minister was his surrogate father. And the Baptist minister um, became ill with cancer. He called the young Clinton to his bedside and made him promise as the pastor's dying wish that he would always stand four square alongside Israel. And Clinton was telling uh, Robbie in this with, with tears streaming down his face, tears streaming down his face. So that deep spiritual connection, and it goes on and on. Condoleezza Rice, 
um, came to the Middle East during her tenure as Secretary of State 26 times to try to advance the Israeli-Palestinian peace process and asked why she kept on doing this. She had one answer. It's because I am the granddaughter and daughter of Presbyterian ministers, just like Woodrow Wilson. All right, that spiritual connection drove her to try to restore tranquility to the Promised Land. Amazing. Now, Israel is not just a Jewish state. In 1948, Israel emerged also as a democratic state and the only functioning democracy in the Middle East. And that became another component, another layer, if you will, in the U.S.-Israel relationship, and a very important relationship. This is uh, another important layer because here was a country that um, revered the same fundamental human freedoms that Americans enjoy, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Ambassador Derejian talked about the Israeli press, which is a free press on steroids. Um, very, very free. Um, sometimes a little too free uh, with their journalistic rules. Um, I respect for the rule of law. Um, we have Arab members of Knesset. We have an Arab uh, Supreme Court justice who, along with two women Supreme Court justice, just passed a very severe ruling against a former president of the state of Israel. No one's above the law in the state of Israel. Um, and this is in a very, diff very difficult environment. Uh, Israel is a country that guarantees not just equal rights to its citizens, but it also uh, guarantees uh, women's rights. It, it guarantees um, gay rights. It is a, uh, a country that actually has a, a Palestinian gay underground in Tel Aviv because uh, in the Palestinian territories, homosexuality is a capital offense. They come to us for shelter. Um, and you should know in the foreign ministry, we have, uh, we've never had a, a don't ask, don't tell issue in the, in the Israeli military, in the, in the, Israeli, in the Israeli foreign ministry, uh, same-sex couples have the same right as uh, heterosexual couples in, if they're traveling abroad. So we're, we're very advanced on these rights, and um, it, 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 it's part of that fabric. It became a close um, spiritual and philosophical relationship. Israel and the United States are certainly Probably the only two countries in the world that have main streets in their central cities named for one another. You know, you have Ben Gurion Avenue and Golda Meir Avenue in New York, but you go to Jerusalem and you have Washington Street and Lincoln Street. Israel is the only country in the Middle East I'm willing to wager that has a memorial and a forest for John F. Kennedy. Only country in the Middle East that has a memorial and a street named for Martin Luther King. I live up the street from Martin Luther King Street. Um, this is in Jerusalem. So you had the spiritual, you had the philosophical, the democratic ties. What you did not have was a strategic relationship. This notion that somehow Israel and the United States have been strategically linked since 1948 is simply untrue. Uh, Israel fought a war in 1967, and we fought that war virtually without any American equipment, no American bullets. And it was only on the seventh day of that six-day war that American policymakers uh, woke up and said, wait a minute, there's this military powerhouse in the Middle East that has just defeated a number of Soviet proxies. We should be allied with that state, and thus was born the U.S.-Israel strategic relationship, which has blossomed ever since. Israel stood beside the United States throughout the Cold War, throughout the subsequent struggle with Islamic extremism, and that relationship today includes intelligence sharing on the highest level. It includes um, joint maneuvers between U.S. and Israel forces. It includes uh, weapons development, particularly in the field of anti-ballistic systems. We develop four different systems together. Um, we are involved in, in medical, military medical cooperation. Um, here's a little interesting fact. I just learned that the, um, the bandage that helped save Gabi Gifford's life was an Israeli military bandage that has, been, that has been surprised to the US military and there just happened to be one of them present that horrible day in Tucson. And she quickly received that bandage. Um, it is um, cooperation um, in, in, in military technology, every American military aircraft, helicopter, and fixed-wing aircraft has Israeli components in it, and without going into too much detail. Uh, it's an extraordinary security relationship. And together, the spiritual ties, the democratic ties, the military and security ties make the U.S.-Israel relationship um, one of 
if not the most multifaceted and deepest relationship that this country, the United States, has had with any country in its uh, post-World War II period. Now, I pretty much knew all that coming into this job because I had spent three decades studying it. And then I got into the position of, of ambassador just about a year and three quarters ago. And, uh, and I learned that the entire experience was very humbling. I learned that, I, in fact, I knew very little about the USS relations. In fact, it was much deeper and more multifaceted than anything I had learned about, conceived of as, a, as an academician. Um, for example, small example, the commercial relationship between the United States and Israel. I had no idea. Israel is America's 20th largest customer in the world. The United States does more business with the state of Israel than it does with Argentina, uh, with Russia, with Saudi Arabia, that all of your computers work on Israeli components, that you, know, you all have cell phones with little screens on them. 70% of those screens are, uh, are made in the state of Israel. Occasionally you get sick. Unfortunately, you have to take antibiotics. 80% of your antibiotics, or your generic antibiotics, are made by Israeli companies. Um, Israel um, is exporting um, alternative energy, alternative energy um, research in the United States. We're cooperating together now on the first fully inclusive uh, electric car system, the Better Place system. It's a U.S.-Israel project. We're involved in nanoscience. I understand that Houston involved in nanoscience in this university uh, with the state of Israel um, in so many different fields. And I learned about it every day, really. And, and it's a humbling experience to know this. Now, does this mean we agree on everything? We don't. We've had some disagreements. And over the course of the generations, the, the decades, Ed, I know you remember some of them, we've disagreed on things. And during the period of the Obama administration, we've had uh, disagreements over two issues relating to the peace process, um, one on, the, on Jerusalem. And it's, it's, it's an agree it's agreement that is not new to the, the Obama administration. It's a disagreement that goes back to 1967. In certain ways, it goes back to 1948. In 1948, the city of Jerusalem was divided between the Jordanians in the east, the Israelis in the west. We um, claimed the western part of the city uh, as our capital. The United States did not recognize that capital. The American embassy is still in Tel Aviv. Uh, for the basic reason is that the United States was still committed to the partition resolution of 1947, uh, which called for Jerusalem to be an international city. And um, Jerusalem has been our eternal capital. Uh, has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years spiritually, so that was, it was inconceivable that a Jewish state so constituted as a Jewish state would have another city as its capital, uh, but the United States didn't, didn't recognize it. And then 1967, after the Six-Day War, when Israeli forces reunified the city, and a month later the Israeli government annexed the eastern part of the city and declared the entire city at our capital, uh, the United States didn't rec still didn't recognize the capital and didn't recognize the, the, the annexation either. Uh, P.S., the United States never recognized the Jordanian annexation of Jerusalem prior to 1967, to be fair. It wasn't just about us, it was about Jerusalem. Um, and, um, and I want to present the American position well. In Congress, sometimes I'm, I'm introduced because of my accent as um, the American ambassador to Israel. I have to correct people. It's um, very embarrassing. But I, I do want to do justice to the American position on Jerusalem. The American position of Jerusalem is that the status of Jerusalem would be determined in peace process, in the peace talks. Until that time, the United States would like to preserve the status quo there. Our position is that this is our capital and that, um, that every Arab and every Jew has a right to live anywhere in the city, as every Arab and every Jew would have a right to live anywhere in Houston and that this is a living capital and you cannot freeze construction in certain parts um, to the discrimination of other parts. We have mixed neighborhoods in Jerusalem. So you can't have a Jerusalem where you have some neighborhood where an Arab can build a, a city, a, 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 an apartment, but a Jew can't. It, it's very, very problematic. It's also against Israeli law because under Israeli law, uh, Jerusalem has exactly the same status as Tel Aviv or Haifa, and the Prime Minister of Israel has no more authority to tell somebody they can't build anywhere in the city of Jerusalem than the President of the United States has a right to tell anybody they cannot or can or cannot build a, a, uh, an apartment anywhere in Houston. It's Israeli law. But what the current Israeli government does which is very much uh, a departure from previous American po Israeli policies going back to Golda Meir, 
is that we recognize that the Palestinians also have a position on Jerusalem, which is not our position on Jerusalem, and we understand that the Palestinians are going to bring that position to the negotiating table. Listen carefully. We understand they're going to bring that to the position to the negotiating table, and it will be on the table. We understand that. Settlement issue, also very, very complex. Um, beginning with the Nixon administration. Now we're talking about late 60s, early 70s. The United States has expressed reservations about the building of Jewish communities in the West Bank, which Israel captured from the Jordanians uh, in 1967. Uh, originally, it was thought that the West Bank, in American terms, would serve as the basis of a Jordanian-Israel treaty. Uh, we were able to reach a treaty with the Jordanians, irrespective of what was going on in the West Bank, um, as well as with the Egyptians, as well, irrespective of going in the West Bank. Our position has been, first of all, based on, again, that spiritual connection. This, these, these are the heartlands of the Jewish people. You look in the Bible, Haifa's not in there. Uh, you look in the Bible, Tel Aviv is in the Bible, but it's a town in Babylonia. It's actually not in the land of Israel. What's in the Bible is Jericho, Bethlehem, uh, Bethel, Hebron is in the Bible. So again, a Jewish state constituted as a Jewish state, irrespective of whether the government is left, right, up, down, center, that government will have an impossible task killing a Jewish person that they cannot live in their tribal lands. Um, very, very difficult, very difficult. Um, beyond that, there's security need for the settlements. Israel's borders before 1967 at its most populous part of the country was eight miles wide. Those were not defensible borders. And if you look on the map, many of these settlements were designed to thicken out Israel's borders and give a strategic depth. A strategic depth, as we've known in recent conflicts, whether in Gaza and in Lebanon, is a very crucial component in our security. So we had these two understandings. We had these two things, and we have disagreed. During the Obama administration, the settlement, certainly in the early part of the administration, the settlement uh, issue became very much to the fore. It, the press played on it very, very heavily. Um, but as you see, it has calmed down a tremendous amount. It's tremendous, tremendous amount because of a number of undertakings that the Netanyahu government has made. You remember there was a 10-month moratorium uh, designed to get the Palestinians back to the negotiating table. They came to the negotiating table rather belatedly three days, three weeks before the end of that moratorium, unfortunately. But even after the moratorium expired, uh, the Netanyahu government made a number of undertakings to ensure that whatever building takes place in the West Bank, it will be responsible, limited, and limited and restricted. Um, it is much less, much lower level than in previous eras, uh, certainly during the, uh, the Robin years when the, when the settler population doubled during that period. It's much, much less than now. Um, and that um, there will be no new settlements created, no outward expansion of settlements on new territories, no even incentivation, incentivization offered uh, to Israelis to move to the settlements, and that, and here's the biggest undertaking, that whatever construction takes place in the West Bank will not impact the peace map. We are committed to creating a two-state solution based on a contiguous and territorially viable Palestinian state. Okay, I understand that. And, um, and so, you know, we've had these disagreements on the peace process, but the agreements between the United States and Israel on the peace par process greatly, greatly overshadow, actually dwarf our disagreements. Uh, we agree, again, on the need for a viable and permanent legitimate two-state solution. A Palestinian state that will be the national home of the Palestinian people and will recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. That type of mutuality is an agreed upon tenet of our mutual policies on the peace process. It, we agree on the need for direct negotiations between Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders, no trying to sidestep the issue by going to the United Nations or to other international bodies. We, uh, we agree on the need for security guarantees for Israel. The administration very much recognizes that we, we, we withdrew from Lebanon in 2000, we withdrew from Gaza in 2005, hoping to generate conditions conducive for peace, and we didn't get peace. We got thousands of rockets raining down in our territory. We need security guarantees. We agree on the need to keep, to discuss the possibility of demilitarizing the Palestinian state, ensuring that state will not have missiles that will rain down in our cities, ensuring that state will not have the ability to make treaties with hostile entities such as Iran. We agree on all of that. 
And so generally, with what I knew and what I learned as ambassador, I see in a relationship that is highly dynamic, deep, intimate, unbreakable, and just inestimably strong. And together, we are facing great challenges in the Middle East. I don't have to stress what has gone on in the Middle East in just the last four or five weeks, from the uprising in Tunisia to the Hezbollah takeover of Lebanon with its 50,000 missiles Hezbollah has faced in all of our towns and cities, our neighborhoods, to uh, the leak of Palestinian papers, diplomatic papers, which has also had an impact on the peace process. And finally, over the last week and a half, the, the extraordinarily dramatic events in Egypt, which will reverberate throughout the region in ways which none of us know. Neither we know, nor the Americans know, nor I think nor the Egyptians know at this time. Together, we face all of these challenges. But we also face extraordinary opportunities. Opportunities together in our research for the search for alternative energy, for nanoscience, for medical breakthroughs. All of this is happening. Israel and the United States are committed to achieving a dream. A dream of a Middle East where Israel, and not just as Palestinian neighbors, but all of our Arab neighbors, together, we aspire to achieve a dream of a Middle East in which our children, our grandchildren can live in peace, can live in prosperity and permanent legitimacy. A Middle East that is free of the threat of weapons of mass destruction. And together the United States and Israel are working very closely to meet the threat of the Iranian nuclear program. Again, a source that could have been, an issue that could have been one of great diversity, and great divergence between us. It's a source we are deeply working together to prevent Iran from acquiring military nuclear capabilities. That Middle East. And that, creating that Middle East is a dream which we share and together, and to recall the words of, words of William Butler Yeats, it's a dream, the realization of which we bear the responsibility. Thank you. Well. So a question? Okay, please. The floor is open for questions. The ambassador is willing to take uh, questions. Uh, raise your hand and identify yourself, and uh, I'll try to... Well, you, uh, you've obviously answered everyone's questions. That's it. Michael, I don't do it. Please, could go Yes, sir. Why would Israel stop building the West Bank? Why would Israel stop building the First of all, for the reasons I mentioned, our settlement policy has been a policy that has been consistent since 1967. It's not the policy of this government, it's the policy of Golda Meir, it was the policy of Yitzhak Rabin. And for the reasons I mentioned, there is the spiritual connection and there is the strategic necessity to thicken our borders. Uh, beyond that, we believe that settlements are a core issue. Settlements we see as a subcategory of the territorial and border issues which we see as a subcategory in turn of the strategic issues, once of the security issues. Once we have ironed out the security understandings with the United States, with the international community, and with the Palestinians, we'll be able to throw gr far greater flexibility on our borders. Uh, Tony Blair, the representative of the quartet, I just heard him recently at the Saban Forum um, in Washington, said that no Israeli government, again, left, right, center, can't agree on a border until we know the nature of the Palestinian state on the other border, on the other side of that border, how it's going to be governed, how its uh, military or security forces will be framed. Nobody can do that. And we understand that the settlements are a controversial issue. We understand that they present a serious problem for the Palestinians. We Palestinians have, prob have, 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 have uh, policies that are serious problems for us not the least of which has been their support for the Goldstone uh, report, not the least of which is their attempt now to sidestep the peace process by going to the Security Council and other international organizations. We don't like it, but we understand that we have to negotiate at the, at the table and not try to avoid these issues. And uh, as we said, as the Prime Minister has said, whatever building is taking place now will be restrained and restricted and responsible the settlements will not be outwardly expanded almost all of this construction is going on inside the settlements and we know that someday there's going to be a border 
And that border will not be to everyone's liking. And we're going to try to create a border where the, which satisfies the majority of the Palestinians and the majority of Israelis as well. And we want to address the settlement issue at the negotiating table. That's why. Could you wait for the microphone to come up? The microphone. Thank you. Uh, what we've seen on the television about the Egyptian uprising is centered on one square in Cairo for the most part mm -hmm. and a limited number of people. I believe there's some 80 million people in Egypt and I don't know how many are protesting, but it's certainly a de minimis percentage of that. Um, do you have any idea whether this uprising is indeed popular? I mean, do the other 80, 79 point something percentage of the people agree with this? I mean, well, it's, so, it's so typical that where the Taliban, mm -hmm. I mean, what we see in this country is just centered on that one mm -hmm. sort of area. And it, it, it concerns me that maybe this is not that popular an uprising. Mm -hmm. and, and the other part of my question is how concerned is your government about it? Okay. Keep in mind that we're dealing with a very fluid, possibly flammable situation. And uh, the Israeli army, the Israeli uh, government is, um, is acting with great restraint here. As you heard, you, those of you who have you know, been watching the very lengthy, detailed commentary uh, on, uh, on American television, the, the Israeli voice has been conspicuously absent for that. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll issue a disclaimer right away. I'll be very limited in what I'm going to say about Egypt today. I hope to not disappoint too many of you. It, it is true. You have been seeing on American television a, a certain slice. Uh, of life in Cairo. Our embassy is, uh, is uh, located in a very different place from where the American embassy is. American embassy is close to Tahrir Square. Ours is in a different area. And uh, in my discussions with, uh, with our, my counterpart in, in, in Cairo, uh, they have a different perspective of what's going on there. It is very difficult to know what's going on in all of Egypt. Um, I don't think the United States has a complete picture. Israel doesn't have a complete picture. I don't think the Egyptian government has a complete picture. I don't know anybody truly knows. What we do know is that a situation has changed there, and that uh, the Egypt we knew will not be the Egypt, Egypt probably that we will know, and that there is a, a process of change there. There will be a transition of some sorts. We have an interest. We have an interest in that that, that transition uh, be stable, and that um, while the people of Israel uh, want all of our neighbors to enjoy the democratic liberties and freedoms that we enjoy and that we believe that democracies, relationships to two, two democracies, especially peace arrangements with two democracies, are all in the long run more stable than democracy, the relationship between a democracy and non-democracies. Uh, we also have concerns. We saw what happened in Iran in 1979. We saw what happened in Gaza in 2006. We see how uh, democratic situations can be hijacked uh, by extremist organizations which are very well organized and focused and funded. And so we have that concern. Our overriding concern is that whatever transition takes place in Egypt, that it will uphold the peace relationship between Israel and Egypt in, the United, in, in, in Egypt and Israel. That is absolutely central for us. Essential for us, it's essential for the region, it's essential for the Palestinian Authority, it's essential for the future of this peace process. Um, and those are our overriding concerns. Again, um, nobody knows fully what's going on in Egypt. No one knows fully what's going to happen in Egypt. Anybody tells you they know that, uh, don't trust them, because nearly nobody knows. Um, but we have our interests, we have our hopes, and, and we do hope the best for our Egyptian neighbors. We do. Gentlemen here, then we'll get to the lady. I've got two questions. First, what was the role of the Soviet Union in establishing of the State of Israel? I heard that Stalin was actually pro-Israel, and yeah. I just want to confirm that, number one. Oh, good, an historical question. <laughs> I get to wax history, historically. And yeah. number two, are yeah. there more allies in the yeah. world of Israel, except yeah. for the United States? I'm sorry, are they what? Are there more allies in the world? Except like, for the United States? Except for the United States. And oh, in yes. particular, yeah. I'm interested mm -hmm. in, in Germany mm -hmm. position. Because okay. I, I know that Germany was very supportive of Israel after... And still is. And still um, is. So that's what I'd like yes. to know. Yes. Um, Egyptian leader Merkel was in Israel this week, for example, for very close talks with us. We have a very um, 
strong working relationship with her and with the German government for a long time. Uh, about the Soviet Union, good. I'd love to be able to answer questions as an historian. Uh, gets me off the hook for all of about two seconds. Um, uh, Stalin was viciously anti-Zionist. Uh, many many a, a Russian Zionist and Jew found their way into the gulags. Uh, those of you who remember the doctor's plots and the purges. Um, but in uh, 1946, uh, 46, uh, Stalin all overnight, literally overnight, uh, reversed uh, uh, the Soviet Union's policy and began to support the creation of a Jewish state um, in Palestine for one principal reason. It, it, it uh, dealt a severe blow to the British Empire. And if you look at your map, Israel divides Egypt and Jordan and Iraq. And, and before that, a, a British soldier could get on his, his motorcycle or his camel or whatever and drive from the Suez Canal all the way to the Persian Gulf and never leave British-controlled territory. Israel, the creation of a Jewish state, particularly one that included the Negev Desert, divided that empire in half. And, and Israel had a strong com socialist uh, co component. I, I went to Israel when I was 15 and I worked on a very socialist kibbutz and there was a lot of warm feelings by, about Stalin even then. Um, so all of that uh, contributed to the change of the, of the Soviet policy and the uh, Soviet bloc was, was important in providing arms uh, for, uh, for the struggling state of Israel after its creation on May 14, 1948 and it was attacked by six Arab armies. It was with Czech arms that we were able to uh, repulse those forces. Um, but the, uh, the United States still was the first nation uh, on earth to recognize the recreated Jewish state. Truman beat Stalin to that. Um, and right after the creation of the status, we actually have the date for when this happened, uh, Stalin reverted to being anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and began to support the, uh, the Arab regimes that were seeking to destroy the state of Israel. And, uh, so, and that remained Soviet policy pretty much to the end of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, does Israel have other allies in the world? Israel has many Arabs and allies in the world. And sometimes people, I, I'll never forget, you, very often a journalist will come into my office and say, how does it feel to know the whole world hates you? And I said, well, let, let's decide. What do you mean? Does the world con conclude, uh, in your world, does it include one billion Indians? Does it include 1.3 billion Chinese? Your world? Does it include Eastern Europe? Does it include many countries, like Germany, that have very strong relations with the United States? Does that mean, again, do they agree with us all the time? No, they don't necessarily agree with us all the time. But I can remember a time when the former Soviet bloc was as hostile, if not more hostile, toward us than, uh, than some of the Arab states. Uh, I can remember a time when India was very hostile, when China was hostile. Today, our last year, 2010, our trade with, Indi with, with, with China went up 100%. Tri trade with, Isra with, with China now accounts for 20% of Israel's foreign trade. I got a son who speaks fluent Mandarin, who's <laughs> working, working with China-Israel relations. Um, India, tremendous friend, tremendous friend. If you come to Washington, I recommend you do this in December. You can go to the Israeli embassy uh, Hanukkah party held at the Indian embassy. We, held, we, we have a joint Hanukkah party with the Indians, um, believe it or not. Um, I know this is going to sound strange to some of you, that in, by almost every criteria, Israel in 2011 is in an incalculably better geostrategic economic situation today than it has been at any time in the last 62 and a half years of its existence. Because of these relationships, and we have a peace treaty with Jordan, and we have a peace with Egypt that is held now for more than three decades, and we hope it will continue. We have a reason to believe that it will continue. Israel, member of OECD this year, one of the 30 most, 31 most developed economies in the world. Uh, 2010, the highest level of tourism in Israel history. We're, we've now exceeded it by 27% already in 2011. Israel, with all of the threats we face, is an amazing relationship, and we have this multifaceted, deepest relationship with the United States. So we are far, far from alone in the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen here. I'd like to get you back on the hook. And, uh, <laughs> I just arrived from Israel about yes. four days ago and uh, on an annual trip. And over the years, my wife and I have made friends with a lot of people who you know, but these people here would not know. And we have lunches and dinners with them. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, learn a lot. Uh, 
My, they're worldly people. However, they do not seem to understand, or maybe they don't agree, or maybe, or maybe I'm wrong, that foreign policy of the United States is way down the list of issues for the American people and for Congress and for the administration. It's jobs, it's the economy, it's housing, it's trade, and probably the only exception is China, which is a big trading partner of the U.S. And as important as the Middle East is, and I think it's important, and it's not being ignored by the U.S., uh, it is not the main issue of, of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the U.S. people right now, and these very worldly people uh, could not understand it, other than one who said that Israel should give back the million two of humanitarian aid they get from the U.S. voluntarily, because as you say, the economy there is brilliant and, mm -hmm. and, and booming, and uh, uh, it would be a good per, uh, PR gesture. I don't mm -hmm. think it will happen. Okay. So you put me back on the hook. Hook's deep. I'm writhing. <laughs> um, listen, one of the hardest jobs I have, basically I would say it's, not, it's, also, it's also the main job I have, is interpreting America to Israelis and interpreting Israelis to Americans. Okay. Now many Israeli leaders are, are, have, have extensive experience with America. Prime Minister Netanyahu is a graduate, graduate of MIT. Uh, Defense Minister Barak is a graduate of Stanford. All right. they, they know America very well. They spent a lot of time here. But the America they know is an America of the late 60s, 70s. At the most, it's an America of the 80s. And trying to acquaint, inform Israeli leaders, the America of 2011 is, is not always easy. Just what you said, where America's concerns lie, uh, with jobs, with the economy, um, and to understand that there have been changes in this country. This country is also a very dynamic country. And it, it's a challenge sometimes. Literally, this week it was a challenge, trying to explain uh, why you know, certain projects, we couldn't ask for an additional X number of million dollars for a project because Congress is not in that mood. Congress is talking about cutting back, not adding. Um, on the American side, explaining not just the Israeli perspective, say our concerns about what's happening in Egypt, and we, again, we have very, I wouldn't say daily, hourly conversations about this. The level of, of communication is so intense and so intimate and frank. Um, but also explaining a Middle East reality to American audiences in general. Um, one of the hardest things I have to try, a point I try to get, get across is that um, the Middle East is not something you can turn your back on, ever. This isn't, you know, those of a certain generation remember the American withdrawal from, from Vietnam. Remember those helicopters being pushed off the, the aircraft carrier? Uh, and you could, you could withdraw from Vietnam in 1975 and pretty, be pretty, pretty certain that the North Vietnamese were not going to follow you to Houston. And, uh, but it's not true in the Middle East. You know, American forces will be withdrawing from Iraq this year. They'll be, as the President mentioned in his State of the Union address, starting in July, there'll be a bit, bit of a, a drawdown in Afghanistan as well. But the is, Middle East is not going to go away from your, from your lives. The Middle East is going to be coming to a neighborhood near you. And it's, um, it's nothing you, the, Middle, the United States will continue to be extensively, and some would even argue existentially, involved with the Middle East uh, for certainly this generation, if not generations to come. And there is no turning away. And um, America's aid to its allies in the Middle East, Israel, but not only Israel, Jordan and Egypt, is a vital part of assuring America's long-term security in its relationship with this very crucial and often volatile region. And um, I know your friends are worldly, but Israel receives no humanitarian aid <laughs> from, uh, from the United States. It receives military aid. Uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his first term of office in the 90s, um, unilaterally uh, forfeited the uh, civilian aid that in Israel received, we only received military aid, the vast majority of which is uh, spent in the United States. And um, coming up shortly, the, almost the entire, more than the entirety of which will be spent in the state of Texas uh, because of the F-35 fighter, which is made in Fort Worth. And uh, we've just uh, 
purchased the first 19 of these jets, and they cost an entire year's worth of aid. So, <laughs> and it's, that's only the beginning of what we need in terms of JFF in order to offset uh, sales. Um, just an action, I want to just a, a, a sort of a, a, uh, an epilogue to that remark. Successive American uh, administrations have made an historic undertaking to the state of Israel. They have, they have uh, committed to uphold what's known as Israel's qualitative military edge, QME for short. QME means that Israel should be able to defend itself by itself against any potential Middle Eastern adversary or any combination of Middle Eastern adversaries. Think about that, what that means in terms of an undertaking. And essential to that undertaking is that American aid, which in terms of the overall military expenditure in this country is very, very, very small. It's about the half of the price of one US destroyer, a new destroyer but enables us to maintain our qualitative military edge in the face of very large arms sales, including American arms sales, to Arab regimes. And um, so that aid is a crucial, crucial component. I would say it is the cornerstone of America's commitment to uphold Israel's QME. And in the United States' successive administration, not the Obama administration, the Bush administration, going back, have viewed that QME as an American interest, not just an Israeli interest. So there's another example of our very extraordinary relationship. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with uh, great trepidation, I turn the microphone over to my wife. And I'm going, <laughs> and I'm going to claim diplomatic immunity because right. I have no idea what she's going to ask. <laughs> go ahead, Frank. That's fine. Okay. Uh -huh. so, Ambassador, I, I understand the reasons mm -hmm. for which you play the uh, Israeli-US relationship on the pedestal. But I'd like to hear you tell us how you think Israel could engage in direct, much more in direct negotiations with its Arab neighbors to achieve peace without the U.S.? Hmm. Well, it's happened. You know, you know, the the what became the Camp David Accords of 1979 began with the strict discussions between the Israelis and the Egyptians, and the Americans were bought at a time when we needed bridging proposals. When the, when, the, uh, when the talks had reached an impasse, we were able to reach an agreement uh, with the Jordanians, largely without American involvement. And um, the Oslo Accords in 1993 were negotiated largely directly between Palestinians and Israelis, and the Clinton administration was brought in um, very, really about four days before the signing ceremony in September of, uh, of 1993. And then the Clinton administration became more directly involved, again, in bridging. Um, we are, one of the reasons that we so stress the need for direct negotiations, we have seen that, that, that where peace has succeeded, one of the major components, not the exclusive component, but it's a major component, is the ability for Israelis and Arabs to sit directly across one another at a table. And we also recognize that at certain points we may not be able to bridge the gaps between us and that the United States should be in the room, if not at the table, ready to bridge those. We understand that role. Um, Right now we have a problem because the Palestinians won't sit with us. For the last two years, they, with a very short um, interregnum of about three weeks, they, they, they have not been willing to sit with us for a variety of reasons. One of them is the settlement issue, but for 17 years they negotiated it while we were building the settlements and it wasn't an issue. It has become an issue now. The, the Palestinian Authority is not in the easiest situation. The Palestinians themselves are divided, half of them under the control of Hamas. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's that shaky, you know, that shaky uh, control that Abu Mazen has over the, over, the, over the Palestinian areas in the West Bank. So what we can do, and I think we have been doing it, is to understand that peace is also based, of, it's, it's two parallel processes. We, we sometimes refer to it as top down and bottom up. Uh, top down are the direct talks, which are stalled, but bottom up is, is advancing uh, very, very uh, favorably. Uh, the Palestinian economy uh, in the West Bank has a growth rate now of about between 8 and 11 percent, which by global terms is quite remarkable. Uh, thousands of new jobs have been created. The Palestinian uh, security forces, uh, many of them trained by the United States, have deployed now in, in four major Palestinian cities in the West Bank. The Israeli forces have moved back from those cities. They're not in those cities anymore. Um, we have removed hundreds of roadblocks and checkpoints that were left over from the Second Intifada that has facilitated the flow of traffics and goods. 
And our militaries are very closely coordinated. Um, Palestinians don't always like us to talk about it, but they're very, we have a very close relationship with them and a good relationship. If we can only, we understand that there's no substitute for the top down. At the end of the day, there's no economic peace. It, it won't hold. Palestinians have to have a political horizon where they know that someday at the end of that road, there is independence and sovereignty. We understand that. But in the absence of direct talks, Let's build up the economy and create the, the foundations for peace. And Prime Minister Fayyad is building institutions which we view as a very positive contribution. And um, situation, we look at the Middle East often, you know, we see the dire and we see these headlines and we see the demonstrations in Tahrir Square and we think that the whole thing is going up in flames. And the fact is I have a different perspective because I see behind the scenes and I see many uh, sources for, for hope and optimism as well. And the lady behind. Uh, the lady behind first, and then. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hello. Oh, uh, no, no. We, we have it uh, over here. Go ahead. W women should definitely take. Yes, the, we haven't had a, Please. Please go ahead. <laughs> is it my turn now? Yes. It is. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, we're here in the James Baker Institute. Uh, several years ago, 12 or 13, something like that. I was traveling on U.S. State Departments in the Middle East. Ambassador Jurijian's already heard this a long time ago. Uh, among other places in Israel, they made a big to-do about me being in their country because I already had met the mayor of Carmiel in your country mm -hmm. when he visited in Houston. And then I went on to a conference. And he and I stayed in touch for several years. And then I think he died or left office and his relative took place as uh, the mayor, and I was beautifully entertained in Carmiel. There is a college there, or a university, in that city where James Baker himself was present and planted a date tree, which started out two feet tall, and by the time I got there, it was six or seven feet tall, and they had dates, boxes of dates for me to bring back to Houston to give to James Baker, who was their good friend. And so at the last, I've lost touch a little bit, but the last mayor I was in touch with was Adi Eldar in Carmiel, and I wonder if you happen to know him or you know about the village or the town of Carmiel, don't you? Well, I know Carmiel very well. I do not know the mayor. It is a, a, a gap in my knowledge. <laughs> well, whoever it is, would you kindly give my best regards to the mayor of Carmiel yeah. and ask about the yeah. uh, date tree? Carmiel is, Carmi is a wonderful town in uh, lower western Galilee. Visit it. It's a lovely town. Yeah. Yes, uh, lately the Palestinians have been making their rounds in the world and with a limited degree of uh, success, they've gotten some countries to recognize a Palestinian state in the borders, in the 67 borders. Um, are they walking away from the Oslo Agreement, from the negotiating table? Where does this leave Gaza? And what is the uh, Israeli position about this? It is, in fact, their, their attempts to sidestep the peace process by getting um, Latin American countries, uh, the Russians, they're trying to get the Europeans on board to recognize a Palestinian state in advance of the, uh, of the peace process. That is a violation of the Oslo Accords. Oslo Accords say that, that, that there is no alternative to direct negotiations. It also um, conflicts with the Obama administration policy. Secretary of State Clinton has come out and said unequivocally that there's no alternative to direct negotiations leading to peace. Um, we view it as very harmful. We view, we view it as deleterious to the peace process because peace negotiations are messy. You get into negotiations, you've got to make concessions. We have to make painful concessions. The Palestinians have to make extremely painful concessions. I in no way diminish the, the pain of the Palestinian, of the concessions that the Palestinians have to make. But there are no alternative for actually going to reach a permanent and legitimate peace. If you can receive concessions outside of the negotiating process without making any concessions, why get into negotiations? So these states in Latin America and elsewhere that are giving the Palestinians what they might have gotten into negotiations without concessions, they are not advancing the peace process. In fact, they are doing just the opposite. They are impeding, impairing the peace process because they are disincentivizing the Palestinians to join direct negotiations. And uh, I cannot make this point more emphatically. And here's another 
example of where we have a complete agreement with the Obama administration. They understand this too. And um, we have reason to believe that the, um, the coming summit of the Latin American uh, uh, countries will not pass a resolution recognizing that unilaterally declared independence. At the end of the day, it won't give the Palestinians what they want, which is independence and security and legitimacy, and it won't give us what we need either, which is security and recognition. So it, it, the whole enterprise is, is very harmful and, 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 and regrettable. Uh, you had another question, I think it tacked on to there, and I'm trying to remember if that was a... If I answered the entirety of it. Oh, Gaza. That's what I wanted to get at. Listen, obviously Gaza is under the control of Hamas. Haza, Hamas is not going to meet the quartet's three conditions for joining the peace process. They have to recognize Israel. They have to disavow terror. They have to recognize all previous agreements between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, including the Oslo agreements. They're not going to do that. We see no indication of that. And so we proceed along with the hope, okay? I don't, I don't want to sound Pollyannish here, but we proceed with the hope. The hope is that we can conclude a two-state agreement with the Palestinian Authority. And that the Palestinian state comes into being with legitimacy, with dignity, with prosperity. And the people in Gaza have none of that. They have 60% unemployment. They are isolated. And that the people in Gaza will look at what the Palestinians in the West Bank have and look at what they have and they'll conclude the reason for the disparity is one word and that's Hamas. And they'll get rid of Hamas. And at that point, Gaza will become part of the two-state solution, and uh, it will join. And that is the, the common assumption on which, under which the United States, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority, must be said here, we all operate under that assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for coming today. Yes, I'm listening. Uh, my question to you is um, on the Muslim Brotherhood, and I know it's a touchy situation, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, what can you say about your views of whether the Muslim Brotherhood can mm -hmm. be a productive force and what's going on in Egypt? All right. Our, 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 the, the, the opinion of our security um, echelon, our military uh, researchers, is, is, is categorical in this sense. It is, the Muslim Brotherhood has gone through no moder moderation process. The Muslim Brotherhood remains um, committed to the destruction of the State of Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood remains committed to the creation of uh, Islamic governments under Sharia law throughout the Middle East, doesn't recognize the legitimacy of, uh, of more secular-minded governments, um, unequivocally opposed to the United States and the West, to American-style democracies, um, no modification process. That the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood, though it may be a minority movement, uh, in Egypt, it remains the only movement that is highly organized, uh, funded, focused, led. The Egyptian op opposition is very diffuse, um, leadership unclear, and that there is a danger, as there was a danger, as, and we saw that danger how um, it resulted in the, in the hijacking of the Iranian uh, uprising in 1979, the elections in Gaza in, in 2006, that's a danger for us. And we, we have no illusions about the nature of the Muslim Brotherhood or its objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the peace, vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the West. No questions about like Iran. Wow, talking well, about being off the hook. But we'd like to get some uh, questions from the Rice students. Are there Rice students in the... We have some yeah, youngish can people. Can I get a question from one of the Rice students, please? Listen, it's my family friend. Your Go ahead, Tal, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's our neighbor. Uh, Go ahead. Should uh, the spiritual right. connection and, and biblical motivations be allowed to influence policy between the U.S. and Israel, especially as the U.S. attempts to play a mediator role between Israel and a people group with a different ideological and religious tradition? Should be. What was the yeah, should the something? I'm just, we couldn't hear the first part of the question. Uh, should the, the spiritual connection you were talking about mm -hmm. and, and biblical motivations for territorial uh, negotiations? Hmm. Very good question. It's an interesting question. The, the spirit He's in my Middle East class. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. And I, I tell you why, because um, let, let me preface my answer and preface it carefully. Support for Israel in the United States is virtually at an all-time high, all, all high. Um, 
between 63 and 69 percent of the, United, of the citizens of the United States define themselves as pro-Israel. And this is through Pew polls, Gallup polls, they all show the same thing. And there are many reasons for that support. Um, they see us as the, as the ally, as the dependable ally, the stable ally in a, in a Middle East where there's not a lot of dependable allies in that sense, not, not a lot of stability. Um, it's a very important component. Um, I would say there's a certain amount of um, Islamic, you know, fear of Islamophobia in this country that also plays into that. Um, but there is the spiritual component. And it's interesting that among churchgoers in this country, and, and the United States is the most religiously observant country in the modernized world. More people go to a house of worship of one kind or another in this country than in any other industrialized country. Among churchgoers, the support goes up to 82%. It's huge. Now, in a democracy where people in Congress are looking at, you know, listening to their constituencies, yes, that's an important factor. And I see it every time I'm on the Hill. I hear it directly from your representatives on the Hill. They listen to their constituents. And um, so it is, an, it is an component. But, but, when dealing with the hard realities of the Middle East, understanding that we view these areas that you call the West Bank, we call Judea and Samaria, again, these are our, this is the cradle of our civilization. This is our biblical homeland understanding that it's also the homeland of another people, of the Palestinian people, and that there's no choice but to, if we, if we are to live in peace, that there's no choice but to divide it between us, as painful as it's gonna be for both of us. There's no choice. Now, that type of sacrifice may be difficult for some very religiously observant people in this country to, to accept, and I know because I get that type of complaint you know, why are you giving back areas that God gave to the Jewish people? It's not an easy issue for us. It's not easy, it's just because we very much value the support of these church groups. But it, it's there, and I believe at the, at the end of the day, if we are to make peace, and we desperately want to make peace, if we are to make peace, then we're going to have to distinguish, or at least put aside uh, some of our spiritual considerations and look at the hard realities of... Uh, of creating peace between two peoples who view the same area as their, as their patrimony. Hard, it's a good question, thank you. That's why we call on students. <laughs> Join me in thanking the ambassador for being mm. with Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.